This is Junko Furuta, and she is the victim of what's been described as Japan's worst case of juvenile delinquency. What this innocent young girl suffered at the hands of four sick and twisted boys has become one of the most horrifying cases the world has ever seen. The ringleader of these boys, Hiroshi Miyano, oversaw the kidnap, abuse, and torture beyond any level of cruelty any human being could do to one another. They made her their captive, their slave, and their punching bag, before finally freeing her from constant pain by taking her life. This case is perhaps one of the most gruesome one we've ever covered with prolonged abuse and total disregard for human life. Viewer discretion is advised as the details of this crime are extremely graphic and the circumstances are as heartbreaking as they are tragic. April 2nd, 1999. The body of Junko Furuta is laid to rest while mourners struggle to hold themselves together. This unfortunate young girl's journey through life came to an end in the saddest way possible. It's hard to imagine the shock her loved ones must have been feeling after her tortured body was found encased in concrete and dumped at waste ground. The last time anyone had heard from Junko was when she had called home during her disappearance to tell her family she had run away, was staying at a friend's house, and was safe and well. At her funeral, her friends pay their own tribute to this popular high school kid. Born in 1971 in Misato City, a province of Saitama, Japan, Junko led a relatively normal and happy life, working hard to achieve good grades and to build a future for herself. By October 1988, the 17-year-old was living at home with her two brothers and was already working a part-time job. In fact, her popularity wasn't hindered by the fact that she was known to never drink, party, or take illegal drugs. Her respectable behavior didn't stop the constant attention she received, in part due to her beautiful looks and her endearing personality. Her family and many of her close friends all agreed that it's hard to find a young person so dedicated to their future like Junko was. She was so dedicated, in fact, that her two greatest pursuits were diligently attending school and working to save up money for her future. And she even had a job lined up for after she graduated. It looked like she had a dream life already in the works. Junko hardly seemed like the type to attract the bad boy kind of personality, but attract the attention of one upcoming gang member she did, and this young thug had connections with Japan's most feared criminal organization, the Yakuza. Already known as the school bully, 18-year-old Hiroshi Miyano had become involved in the Yakuza after becoming dissatisfied with how much money he was making working a regular job. He had already been involved in several instances of petty crime and had been kicked out of a private school a year earlier because of his problematic and unruly behavior. But this petty criminal had much darker desires than petty theft or vandalism. His involvement with the Yakuza had begun to draw out his most violent tendencies. And he was not alone in his criminal activities. His friends, Joe Ogura, 17, Yasushi Watanabe, 17, and Shinjo Minato, 16, had each had a history of violence and crime. But this was nothing compared to the act of violence they were about to commit together, and in the most cruel and evil way. It started when Miyano asked Junko on a date. He had recently broken up with his girlfriend and told Junko he had a crush on her. With her stunning features and popularity, Miyano saw Junko as an ideal candidate. But Junko was not thinking the same thing, and she knocked back his affections, something that many would not do knowing his dangerous connections and short temper. But Junko did turn him down, and the result was a fatal one. Maybe he felt embarrassed and humiliated, but even if he did, that doesn't excuse what he planned to do to Junko in revenge. He just had to bide his time. Around 8.30 p.m. on November 25th, 1988, Junko was riding her bike home after her full shift at work. She was looking forward to watching the final episode of one of her favorite shows, Tombo. At the same time, Miyano and Minato were out hunting for innocent women to have their way with at a park in Misato. You see, one of this group of boys' favorite pastimes was to rob and assault girls. They did this a lot. They could spot an easy target, and they always seemed to get away with it. 
Many victims might be hesitant to report a crime they have suffered in fear of the Yakuza coming to look for them, as Miyano would always threaten his victims with his criminal connections. For Junko, this night of joy was about to become a night of horror, as she was spotted by the two boys and quickly became their next target. As she rode home on her bicycle, totally unaware of any danger, she was suddenly pushed to the floor by Minato, while Miyano hid nearby, ready to begin his deception. Miyano ran over to her, claiming to have witnessed the attack and offering to walk her home safely. We'll never know if she had any suspicion, or was unsure of her safety during the walk home. There probably wasn't that much time for her to think about it, as along the way, Miyano grabbed Junko and forced her into a warehouse. She must have been terrified at the ordeal she was going through, as Miano began to exact his revenge on her for having the nerve to say no to his advances. As always, he threatened her family with Yakuza thugs if she didn't do exactly what he wanted. What he did want from this innocent girl was nothing short of monstrous. Junko was violated by Miano in the most sickening way, having his way with her without any remorse. After he finished, Miano called his friends to brag about what he had done, but this was only the beginning of Junko's nightmare. She was assaulted again in a nearby hotel by several boys, who appeared to take great pleasure in their despicable act of depravity. The boys then concocted a plan that would eventually become a death sentence for Junko Furuta, but not before she was made to suffer through weeks of agonizing abuse. She was taken to a house that had already been used as a gang hangout by Miyano, Minato, Ogura, and Watanabe for some time. It seemed the perfect place to keep their new captive. Over the next day, they are reported to have humiliated and violated her at will several times. They plan to let other Yakuza members join in on making Junko their slave and ongoing prisoner. This happened before to another girl the gang members had kidnapped. Like Junko, they also violated her in the sickest way before eventually releasing her. But for Junko Furuta, this would have been the only consequence. By the third day, her parents, who by now were beginning to grow sick with worry, decided to call the police to report her missing. When Miyano and the others heard the police were looking for Junko, instead of returning her, they began to scheme. Their plan would ensure that both her parents and the police would call off their investigation. Junko was forced to call her parents and pretend she had run away from home to stay with a friend. She told him that she was safe and convinced her parents to call off the investigation. This gave the four kidnappers the freedom they needed to continue their onslaught of abuse. They had just one more obstacle to overcome, Minato's parents. In order to have an excuse for Junko being around, Minato told them Junko was his girlfriend. This deception appeared to fool his parents at first, although they later admitted they became aware of what was really going on. But knowing their son's violent tendencies and fearing his close affiliation with the Yakuza, they remained silent. It was later revealed his brother had also figured out what was going on in their house, but also chose to stay silent. In the end, the kidnappers didn't even need to pretend as they realized no one was calling the police. It's understandable Minato's family may have feared him and what members of the gang may have done had they called the police on their own, but these three people could have stopped this nightmare early on had they had the bravery to do so. Junko had by now suffered days of violation, torture, and abuse, but the worst hasn't yet come. Around a week into the ordeal, we can only imagine that she had been violated time and time again by the four boys and other gang members that were involved. They were invited to abuse her, and as time went on, the torture became more twisted and inhumane. She was no longer allowed to wear clothes or eat. It's believed on the cold nights she was forced to sleep on the balcony outside. By now, much of what Junko had been through would have broken the spirit of many, but she fought on taking days and days of abuse and beatings, starvation, and even being forced to sit in a freezer where they would make her suffer for hours. Around 10 days into the ordeal, Miano and his friends would intensify their attacks. They no doubt laughed as skewers of hot food were put inside her, causing painful internal damage. Maybe it was this incident that finally gave her the courage to try to escape. Junko somehow found the strength to crawl to a phone in the house, where she managed to dial for the police. As they answered, she must have finally thought she was going to be free of the constant pain. But before she could make her cry for help, Miano entered the room and slammed the phone down. Naturally, the police, who were concerned at the call being cut short, called back the number. Miano answered, and in a cruel twist, managed to convince the police that the emergency call was made in error, something the police never bothered to check on, ending Jingo's hope for freedom. For her disobedience, she was subjected to even more torture beyond anything she had experienced yet. They attended to make sure she couldn't run away again by taking her feet. She was teased with a lit flame while her feet was doused in lighter fluid. They put the flame to her and watched as she burned, causing agonizing pain. But this was not the only time she made a chance for freedom. 
one of the boys who had been invited to violate her had decided to tell his brother what was happening at the Minato house, who then called the police. What happened next is a shocking failure of the authorities, as police went to the house but decided not to search it. They believed the invitation to search the house was sufficient proof that there was nothing to hide. Had they followed through on the information they were given, Junko could have been saved 16 days into her unimaginable captivity, and the four boys could have been made to pay for their crimes. Instead, police walked away considering the matter closed. Her kidnappers decided they needed to have even more of what they considered fun, so Junko was tied to the ceiling and used as a human punching bag in a degrading show of what these four boys thought of human life. It was around this time that Junko was unable to breathe through her nose anymore. She had internal bleeding that was so bad it was seeping into her mouth and blocking her nose completely. She had also lost control of her bowels due to the intense damage to her internal organs. Various foreign objects had been inserted into her, ranging from broken bottles, hot light bulbs, an iron bar, and even scissors. The pain these objects must have caused was unimaginable to endure. By day 30 of her incarceration, she could no longer walk, having to crawl to the bathroom with her broken and twisted hands and feet. Eventually, she could not make it to the bathroom and began soiling the carpets of the house, which only enraged the boys even more. Soiled carpets wouldn't be a problem for her four kidnappers anymore. Around day 30, the damage to Junko's internal and intimate organs were so severe that she could no longer even go to the bathroom. By this point, she must have been a heartbreaking sight. Her face and body were so damaged she must have been unrecognizable from when they first abducted her. While most people were celebrating New Year's Day in 1999, Junko Furuta was alone. She was no longer able to move her body off the ground. She had been treated like an object for her kidnappers. Her wounds were now rotting and causing such a smell that Miano and his friends no longer had physical interest in her, and so they kidnapped a 19-year-old girl on her way home from work and violated her instead. Junko was now over 40 days into one of the most horrifying experiences anyone could possibly live through. She no doubt was considering whether she could go on even another day. She begged her captors to end her life in a cry of mercy to release her from the pain. Instead, they forced her to play a game of mahjong, Either by luck or defiance, she won the game. Miano and his friends did not take this well, and their final onslaught would be brutal and, ultimately, deadly for the girl. So savage that pus covered her body, oozing from her wounds. To keep their hands clean, the four boys wrapped their fists in plastic bags and continued to attack her. She died the following day. It's both a miracle and a tragedy that this innocent girl lasted 44 days of the most intense abuse. Her beautiful looks were destroyed, and the girl who loved to socialize had been alone and scared for over a month. The day she died, Miyano, Minato, Ogura, and Yasushi realized she had passed away. In an attempt to avoid being discovered, they decided to dispose of her body at a nearby landfill, which was a local dumping ground for waste. In one final act of humiliation, they placed her body into a 55-gallon drum, filled it with concrete, and dumped the barrel, hoping it would never be discovered. Were it not for a lot of luck and some stupidity by one of the guilty parties, then it's possible the body of Junko Furuta would have never been discovered, and her family would never have the closure they so rightly deserved. Remember that 19-year-old girl they kidnapped when Miano and his friends were no longer interested in Junko's infected body? Well, the police were determined to catch those responsible, and they found themselves on the doorstep of Miano and Ogura in late January 1999. Both were then arrested. They underwent interrogation in March, the same year after police discovered women's underwear at one of the boys' addresses. Despite the failures of the police at the time, their next move helped to uncover the murder of Junko with some clever interrogation techniques. Miano was told by police that they knew he had committed a murder. Miano crumbled, believing his friend Ogura had told the police about Junko and had landed them both in deep trouble. He told police what he and his friends had done, confessing to both Junko's murder and telling police where the body could be found. This took the police officers by surprise. They had called the boys in for interrogation over an unrelated, unsolved murder of a woman and her child just months before Junko disappeared. Sadly, the murder of this woman and child will remain unsolved at the time of making this video. What police did know was the location of a different victim, one they had been looking for for months. Although police could have done more at the time she was missing, they were now determined to get justice for Junko and her family by making these boys pay with the full weight of the law. Police wasted no time and discovered her body the very next day, on March 30th, 1999. Her body and face were so ravaged by the weeks of abuse that she could only be identified by her fingerprints. 
a sad end to a young life with so much potential that was snatched away by her cruel kidnappers. But what police found next is both shocking and heartbreaking. It took the police by surprise that even with her damaged uterus, she was in fact pregnant by one of her attackers. It did not take long for DNA to pin Miyano, Minato, Ogura, and Yasushi to the sickening crimes that this girl had suffered. Minato's brother was also arrested, but even though they had the main perpetrators in custody, there is still an unknown amount of young men who violated her during her capture that have managed to evade arrest. But justice was not as easy to come by as Miano's confession, as the system was about to fail Junko Furuta in death, as it did during her life. For this most heinous and sickening disregard of human life, you would expect those found to be guilty suffering lifelong prison sentences in the harshest of conditions. Instead, Miano received a relatively light sentence of 17 years imprisonment. He appealed and a furious judge decided to extend his sentence to 20 years. Minato, Ogura, and Yasushi served around eight years each, punishment hardly fitting for the unimaginable crime. It is most likely because of their age that they received such light sentences, or maybe because of their Yakuza connections. They wouldn't have the anonymity they would have hoped for, as although the legal system kept their identity secret, there were others who felt like they should not escape unnamed. Journalists from Shukan Bunshin magazine managed to find their identities and publish them for the world to see, claiming they did not deserve the human right to remain anonymous after what they had done. Today. They roam the streets free after serving their time. It's believed that only Yasushi had not reoffended since being released, meaning these cold, calculating killers may one day strike again. The story of Junko Furuta's 44 days in hell shocked the world. The two police who declined to search the house after the invitation to enter were later fired. Junko had become sealed in popular culture, especially in Japan, where several movies have been based on her ordeal, and Japanese anime is dedicated to her memory. One day, Junko will truly find the justice she deserves. What do you think of this case? What more could the police have done to stop these boys? Did the Yakuza intervene, making sure their sentences were light?